in Authority Bundle 2, tab 30, looking at Fidelis Arde, you just got to um, the question, paragraph 20, at page 759. Guess what? At paragraph 21, the CJU recasts the question. <coughs> and then, if I could invite you to put in a physical or virtual line uh, for my Lord, Lord Justice Warby between paragraph 34 and 35. The entirety of the analysis from 22 to 34 is, if you like, the straight Article 3, Article 13 analysis. And it covers um, familiar ground, uh, citing the most recent case before it that had covered that ground, which is Churchill, which in turn had cited relevant provisions from Kant and his Bernardes. And this is the familiar passage uh, about the duties under Articles 3 and 13. And it arrives at the same conclusion as the previous cases, which is that an exclusion of liability or an avoidance of liability of the kind contemplated by the Portuguese uh, proceedings pursuant to Article 14 and Article 428 of the Portuguese Commercial Code was inconsistent with the scheme of Article 13. And then at 35, the court addresses the argument that had been teed up by that passage I showed you from eight, paragraph 18, where the insurer was seeking to bolster its position on the construction by saying, don't worry, the FGA will pay. So you can proceed to allow us to avoid our policy of an issue, safe in the knowledge that there is someone to pay. And at 35 and onwards, the CJE addresses that argument and says that its primary analysis under Article 3 and 13 <coughs> is not called into question by the fact that it's possible for the victim to receive compensation from the FGA. The payment of compensation by the body referred to in Article 10 1 is envisaged only for cases in which the vehicle that caused the injury or damage has not satisfied the requirement uh, for insurance, referred to in Article 3. That is to say, and here we have the direct lifting of the language from Sonka, a vehicle in respect of which no insurance contract is in place. Now this can only be directed at the facts of this case. <coughs> can only be directed at the circumstances in which the very issue before the court was whether or not that contract was avoidable void ab initio. And what they're saying here, very clearly in my submission, is that Article 3.1 is the answer, and Article 1.4 is not engaged in that case, because it is not a case of a vehicle in respect to which no insurance contract is in place. They then go on to explain, again lifted straight from Songa, uh, such a restriction is explained by the fact that that provision, as is recalled in 23 of the present judgment, requires each member state to ensure, subject to the derogations allowed under Article 4 of the first directive, that every owner of a vehicle <coughs> uh, or keeper of a vehicle normally based in its territory concludes a contract of insurance. See Sonka 30 and 31. 36, however, as recalled in 29 of the present case, the fact that the vehicle is driven by a person not named in the policy relating to the vehicle cannot support the conclusion that the vehicle is uninsured for the purposes of the third third paragraph. And again, that can only be a reference in the context of this case to the um, potential avoidability of the policy on, on the basis of non-disclosure of who the actual driver is going to be. And I showed you the facts in paragraph 15, the basis for the argument of invalidity. And it was that the policyholder concerned had made a false statement on the date the contract was concluded, concluded, claiming to be both the owner of the vehicle and its usual driver. So this is the step change in our submission in the case law. This is the moment when the Sonka reasoning crosses the barrier and is plainly being used to limit <coughs> the scope of the Article 10.1 obligation in a case where there is an argument about the avoidability or avoidance of the policy. And it's that aspect of this case that has never been grappled with 
by any of the domestic UK authorities until the judgment of Mr Justice Friedman. So, um, the next case we need to look at is Smith and Mead, uh, tab 33 of the same book. Um, in some ways, the facts of this case are horrendously complex. In other ways, they're very straightforward. Because, barring the complications of the various settlements, etc., that happened in Ireland as the law unfolded, the essential position in Smith and Mead is identical to this case, as Mrs. Justice O'Farrell alluded to in her first judgment. Mr. Mead owned and insured a vehicle with an insurer. Well, the, difference, the difference is this is an exclusion clause rather than an avoidance. Yes, insofar as uh, any significance is attached to that, but the CJU doesn't. As a, as a matter of fact, that is. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. <coughs> the, the, the basic position seems to be that there was a recurrent problem in Ireland <coughs> with passengers travelling in the back of vans and other utility or work vehicles that weren't intended to convey passengers. And that was, in fact, the uh, facts of the Farrell case, as well as the facts of Smith and Mead. The essential difference between <coughs> Farrell and Smith and Mead is that in Farrell, the vehicle was entirely uninsured, whereas in Smith and Mead, the vehicle was insured by an insurer called FBD, nothing to do with that um, law firm uh, formerly of Fleet Street. Um, <coughs> And uh, in 1999, well before uh, the full effects of, of Ruiz Bernaldez had been teased out, um, the car was in an accident, and um, the passenger, who was sitting in the back of the van, uh, on the floor of the van, it seems, having no seats, claimed compensation from uh, Mr. Mead for his injury. <coughs> the insurance with FPD, and this is my Lord's point, excluded liability in those circumstances. <coughs> and the insurer relied upon the relevant Irish RTA legislation that allowed it to exclude or avoid liability for this risk, as it was a use not covered. Uh, the plot then thickened. In 2009, the Irish court decided uh, on the basis of its then Marlisi construction of the Irish legislation that it had to desupply the exclusion of liability. And you see that at paragraph 17 of the CJU's judgment. After which, FBD settled with Mr. Smith, paid him 3 million euros, and uh, exercised their rights of subrogation with respect to that payment. And it was on the back of those subrogated rights the uh, FBD um, uh, effectively then proceeded against the Irish state. It brought an appeal of 20 against the judgment of the High Court, claiming that the High Court had misapplied the Marlies in case law, and that the effect of the judgment was to circumvent the prohibition on uh, uh, horizontal direct effect uh, in circumstances of a directive. <coughs> And it was plainly seeking to recover from the Irish state the three million pounds it had paid over on the basis of this mistaken Marlies interpretation. Now, um, timing wise, it's notable that this attempt to invalidate the uh, exclusion of liability was going on in 2008 and 2009, by which time uh, Ruiz Bernaldez and Candlin were well known. You can see that from paragraph 29 of the judgment summarising the arguments before the domestic court. <coughs> and um, also, with the benefit of the decision in the first Farrell case. The questions referred by the court were principally about uh, direct effect. Uh, and you can see that at paragraph 32 in the very uh, lengthy questions referred. The 
main part of the CJU's judgment is directed to answering that question about direct effect. And in so doing, it settled some of the long-running controversies of interest to EU law wonks like um, Mr. Moser and myself about the limits on um, vertical direct effect, the so-called indirect direct effect and matters of that kind, and the CIA signals and principle and when it applied and when it didn't apply. And the CJU came down resoundingly for a narrow and conventional view of vertical direct effect, such that, in effect, it was plain that the decision of the Irish High Court to adopt the Mali Seed interpretation it had adopted was wrong. It was on the strength of that reasoning that Mrs Justice Farrell rejected the claimant's attempts at Marley's Seed interpretation in this case. What is, um, <coughs> what is significant <coughs> about this case, it, after the dealing with the CIA signal scenario, is what is said at paragraph 56, 55 and 56. Because having effectively concluded that there was a breach, but the insurer wasn't answerable because it was outside the scope of the vertical direct effect principle, the question arose, well, what's the answer to the potential remedial lacuna? And the court concluded, in the light of all of the above, it must be concluded in the main proceedings that a referring court, which consider it's unable, for sort of contra lego reasons, to construe the legislation in a manner that is compatible with Article is not obliged, in order to determine whether Mr. Smith was entitled to claim from SPD compensation for the harm suffered by him in the car accident, to disapply, solely on the basis of the third provision, those provisions of national law, as well as the exclusion clause to be found, as a consequence of those provisions of national law in the insurance contract taken out by Mr. Killini, and thereby to extend the possibility of applying <coughs> another directive to the sphere of relationships between private persons. Putting that in plain English, what they're saying is um, <coughs> Mr. Mead couldn't rely upon the breach of Article 13 that was contained in Section 65 of the Irish Act in order to exercise rights directly against the insurer. Then this. That said, it must be recalled that in a situation such as that at issue in the main proceedings, a party adversely affected by the incompatibility of national law with EU or a person subrogated to the rights of the party could, however, rely on the case law stemming from Frankovich in order to obtain from... I'm, I'm sorry, I'm being very, very slow. You said that the... Putting in plain English paragraph 55, Mead could not rely on the breach of Article 13 in order <coughs> to exercise rights directly against insurers? The insurer, exactly, because the insurer <coughs> is a private party. It's so the private party is entitled to okay, got it. Private party is entitled to avoid under national law, and because it's horizontal, and private parties' incompatibility with Article exactly. Three doesn't help anybody. Okay, got yeah, it. national law incompatible. Yeah. The private party says, "Yeah, I was being slow." Sorry, that's not at all, my lord. It's, it's very dense stuff. Yeah. But what they're then going on to say is that the remedy in those circumstances is a <coughs> claim for compensation following Frankovich. What there's no trace of, and it's pretty striking, is any suggestion that, don't worry, your remedy in those circumstances lies in a claim against the MIPI under Article 10 uh, 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 1 of the Directive. And this is in circumstances where the same Irish legislation has been recently before the CJU, both Farrell and Witty 1 and Farrell and Witty 2, and in which they well know that the MIB Ireland is an emanation of the state, because that's the sole question raised <coughs> in Farrell and Witty number 2. So they know that the principle of horizontal effects doesn't um, uh, preclude a claim uh, a vertical direct effect doesn't preclude a claim against the MIBI. They've gone to all the trouble in their previous cases, <coughs> cited various points here, the effect that the MIBI is an emanation of the state. But the remedy they reach for when faced with the same Article 13 breach that we're facing here is to say, Frank bitch. That's the dog that didn't bark in the night. Absolutely. 
absolutely the story of Silver Blades in a nutshell. Um, and what's more, once again, it is actually helpful to look at the Advocate General's opinion because he deals with this uh, problem by explicit reference to Fowler and Witty, page 860, paragraph 58. Unlike the cases which gave rise to the judgment in Farrell 1 and 2, <coughs> the dispute in the main proceedings does not involve the Irish guarantee body, namely the MIBI. The reason appears to be that, unlike the owner of the vehicle in which Miss Elaine Farrell was seated, the owner of the vehicle, Mr Philip Mead, in which Mr Smith was travelling, had taken out a policy of motor insurance. As I've already stated, the parties to the dispute in the main proceedings, at the stage of the proceedings which gave rise to this reference, are FBD, the private party, and the Irish state. Once the direct effect of Article 1 of the Third Directive has been acknowledged, there is therefore no doubt as to whether FBD may rely on that provision against the Irish state in order to disapply the, the provisions which are contrary to the Directive. Where it is possible to rely on such a position against an emanation of the state, such as the MIBI, the same must a fortiori be possible against the state in its capacity as a public authority. The state must be prevented from taking advantage of its own failure to comply with EU law. It follows from the foregoing that in the proceedings before the referring court, <coughs> BD is entitled to rely on Article 1 in order to disapply Section 65. If, in the Irish system, the payment of subsidiary compensation by the guarantee body is not provided for where the owner of the vehicle has an insurance policy and that policy does not cover a particular risk, which it ought nevertheless to cover if the state had correctly transposed Article 1 of the Third Directive, it falls to the state to bear the financial consequences. Now there, in a nutshell, is the problem in our case being explicitly engaged with in the context of an identified breach of Articles 3 and 13. And there you have the Advocate General saying in terms <coughs> that it's the state that has to bear the financial <coughs> consequences of that breach. There is not a trace of a suggestion, notwithstanding full awareness of what the MIB's role was, etc., that the remedy lied against the MIB. How does that fit in with the, the, the limitation on the state's liability requiring um, satisfying the court that it's a sufficiently serious breach? I mean, all, all that's being said here at 62 is a very simple equation. Um, if the policy doesn't cover a risk which it ought to cover, it falls to the state to bear. Not yes. it falls to the state to consider whether it might bear. Yes. But, but how, how do we reconcile the two? The first point is, my lord is quite right. There's no disapplication of the requirement for there to be a sufficiently serious breach. But of course, the requirement for a sufficiently serious breach is itself context-specific. And for instance, where the obligation that the state has breached is in the nature of a guarantee obligation, it's uh, generally very much e easier, simply for that reason, to argue that the breach in failing to provide the guarantee sum is sufficiently serious. But here, but we're see, in, see the, the court at paragraph 56 <coughs> expressly says it's Frankovich. Yes. So, so it's endorsed the reasoning. Yes, but the, the court at 56 um, adds two words which aren't there in the AG's opinion at 58. The, the court at 56 says, in order to obtain from the member state, if appropriate, Yes, and that must, you're, you're absolutely right, Lewis, that must connote, if appropriate, because the test of sufficiently serious breach is passed. That must be the gauge as to whether it's appropriate or not. But what we know, and what I'm going to show you from Delaney, is that the state of the law as to the requirements of Articles 3 and 13 has been clear since 2005. And it was for that reason, in substance, that Mr. Justice Jay concluded on the facts of Delaney, which is another policy avoidance case, that there was a sufficiently serious breach and that the UK should pay. And that's why I go back to the point I made in opening. This is not a case with any meaningful remedial lacuna. 
we don't have the Secretary of State um, here, as you started by reminding us. Yeah. Um, and we can't um, adjudicate well, on, 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 on the possible liability of the, of the Secretary of State. The Secretary of State is a party to these proceedings. And I'm entitled to say, and I do say, on his head be it, if he's not here. I mean, the CPR are very clear to the effect about your duties to join all relevant parties, whether you're looking at it in an IP context, uh, Section 102, one of the CDPA given effect to by Section 17 of the CPR. It's absolutely clear that if you join the relevant parties, the relevant parties are all disputed before the court. If you turn to choose to turn up to a preliminary issue or not, on your head be it. We've been nothing if not clear both below and here, as to our analysis of the problem. So, and we, w we took, I think, the punctilious and correct approach of reminding the Secretary of State where we're going by correspondence before this came. They choose not to attend. And they've had your skeleton. They've had our skeleton, absolutely. That's on their head be it. That's why, ultimately, much as I like having an argument with my learned friend, Mr. Moser, I'm, I'm not sure he's really the relevant party. On the other hand, this court as an appellate court is unlikely to rule as if it were a first instance court that on the facts of this case where Frankovich is in play, all the requirements are satisfied. Well, without uh, hearing the party. Um, unlikely. I understand my Lord's reluctance, but let me show you the totality of the material before you reach a conclusion on that. And I will understand your So, um, would, would your position be that if, if um, we were we ended up reluctant to reach a conclusion on that, the solution is still that the remedy is Frankovich? Absolutely. Or nothing? Absolutely. That is my position. Absolutely is my position. I'm saying you can take comfort from the fact that you will know that that alternative route will deliver a remedy. I'll explain that. I mean, it would go so far as to suggest the argument that's been advanced is hopeless. <laughs> when you've read what Mr. Justice Jane says in Delaney. So, um, the last of the cases, the what, liberty... What's the estimation of damages in this case? How many million? It's, a young it's at least a couple of billion. He's a, he, he was a very young man and he's yeah. suffered yeah. a terrible... A young man, tetra partial tetraplegic. It must be, it must be a large... Or size of a seven-figure sum. About twenty, my lords. About twenty million. Yes. <coughs> so, um, liberty. I can take this very quickly, indeed. You've already flushed me out on it. There's, <laughs> there's, there's nothing new here. Its significance is the emphatic repetition of everything in Fidelidad, in a case with facts about as stark as you could want them, because um, having been insured for one purpose, for private use. Can you just remind me of which tab it is? Tab 37. Thank you. Can I just ask what, uh, whose translation this is, because it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's an official translation. It's one we commissioned. <laughs> right. In, in some haste. <laughs> um, well, Deeple would do it better. Well, I'm um, <laughs> Yes, um, that's probably true. Um, we've given you the French as well, if, if that's the language you have. It's only one paragraph, and it's, it's really paragraph easy 69, to understand. Yes. Whose contents are pretty flat. Yeah. Um, the, terrible as the translation may be, the facts are pretty obvious. What happened was that this van that was insured for one purpose was used to run an informal um, uh, transport business, uh, adapted for that purpose, pulling a very heavily loaded trailer full of the luggage of the Portuguese. Portuguese individuals who were commuting between Switzerland uh, and Portugal, and there was a terrible accident in which 10 of them were killed. <coughs> it was in that context where, if you ever wanted a case of avoidance, you couldn't think of more compelling facts for a, an what? insurer to avoid a policy. I don't know, you could try. You could try, but it's <laughs> probably right up there in terms of um, grounds for avoidance of a policy. Notwithstanding that, the CJU repeated word for word pretty much the, the line in um, the Dead of Dad. And we say, this is a consistent approach of the CJU. Of course, this is a post-Brexit um, uh, case. It arises after 
11 p.m. on the 31st of December 2020. <coughs> Nevertheless, you're entitled to have regard to it insofar as it provides any further weight. So the analysis of the authorities under Section 6.2 of the European uh, Union Withdrawal Act, and, and that's what we invite you to do. Uh, the key thing is the CJU, even in case as stark as this, has stuck by its line. So I seem to remember that having regard in this context means adopting the um, House of Lords um, self-direction in 1966, doesn't it? I mean, we're not bound by it. We can depart from it, but we normally would. Um, I'm going to give you a, yeah. a very anarchish answer in relation to that. Yeah. Those provisions under the regulations that extend that approach from Section 6.5 of the European Union Withdrawal Act apply in relation to disputes about retained and what is before you is not a debate about retained okay. EU law, um, precisely because the facts in question are back in 2015, and what we we're arguing about, albeit without the availability of the CJU to hear a reference, is the law as it was in 2015. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's a hot topic, and um, what I just said is not necessarily consistent with what Mr. Just Lord Justice Green um, said in a case about the uh, denied boarding. I think, I think my learned friend, A, it's an interest to agree with me, and I suspect he might do. So. Well, I, I do agree. We're, we're dealing with a, a category of the law in this case that might best be described as accrued EU yes. law. Yes, old EU law. Yes, uh, EU law uh, proper. Uh, as far as the um, uh, reliance on any further later um, uh, CJEU judgments are concerned, uh, those are more in the way of have regard to, perhaps in the way that one, one might have regard to other foreign judgments, as we know, if there's something from Canada or so on, but simply not binding. So that's that's the kind of interpretation that applies to those. Since they're directed at EU legislation, yeah. and adopting EU techniques for the interpretation of that legislation, they're likely to attract particularly care. Well, the main point is they haven't changed their mind. They haven't changed their mind. So what then, <coughs> staying on the plane of EU law, of the authorities on which my learned friend relies? And it is, we submit, the EU authorities that are key to this case, because ultimately, this is a case about the scope of Article 10 and the operation of the principle of direct effect. And it's only if my learned friend fashions a duty from Article 10 that he gets home under direct effect. <coughs> now, there are two cases he relies upon, the Juliana case and the Ostrowski case. And the critical thing to note about both of these cases is that they are not cases about breach of the Article 3 or 13 provisions, whether by allowing insurers to escape their uh, insurance obligations or otherwise. The four cases you've just been looking at are all about that. That's the central issue, the central genesis of the disputes in each of those four cases. What these two cases are instead about is about the scope of the duty to insure in the first place. How wide is the insurance duty? And you'll see what I mean when you turn up Juliana, which is at tab 32. <coughs> it's another FGA case. So, so far they've given us Fidelidad, Liberty, and now Juliana. Portuguese um, MIB is very busy. What happened in this case was uh, the owner of a vehicle took it off road. Basically, took it off the road, put it in a garage, I think. But she took no steps formally to withdraw it from use, so she didn't do the equivalent of a, a sort of statutory off road notice mm. under the RTA. And without her permission, her son took the car, which was because she was no longer using it uninsured, <coughs> drove it, and, and killed himself and two passengers. So he was driving whilst uninsured. The FGA paid out in consequence. And the action and the dispute arose when the FGA sought to exercise its right of recourse against the vehicle's owner for her failure 
to insure the vehicle. That's the genesis of the case. And if you want to identify what the dispute was really about, it was really about whether a car which has been taken out of use informally was still, notwithstanding that, in scope of Article 3 of the Directive. And you'll be unsurprised to hear that applying the very wide approach to what constitutes a vehicle and what constitutes the obligation under Article 3, an approach already plain from the NUG, the court concluded that the Article 3 obligation did arise, notwithstanding that the vehicle was locked up in a garage and wasn't intended for use. And you can see that <coughs> both in the Advocate General's uh, opinion at 31 and following, but more particularly in the court's analysis at page 844, and in particular from after the reformulation of the question at 31, from 34 to 44. Uh, 42. I haven't read this, so um, could you either summarise or give yes. us a moment? So, so I think I can fairly summarise the fact that 34 <coughs> through to 42 is the court uh, applying the principle of effectiveness uh, and the pr protective principles to give uh, Article 3 a wide reading so as to uh, uh, require the insurance of a car even if you don't intend to drive it or use it on the roads and you've locked it up in your garage. That's what's happening here, and you see extensive references in particular to the NUC and the Andrade case and Torero to that effect. <coughs> but once again, what some of the parties attempted was to use Article 10 of the directive and the existence of the guarantee fund attempt to narrow the scope of or the effect of Article 3. Uh, Article 3. And you see, in particular, at 43, the following. The foregoing wide interpretation is not called into question by the arguments submitted by the German government, Ireland, the Italian government, and the UK, according to which a broad interpretation of the scope of the general insurance obligation is not necessary its compensation for the damage or injuries which occur <coughs> in circumstances such as those issues could be paid by the body referred to in Article 4.1. So what they're saying is, you don't need to read Article 3 widely because the guarantee fund will pick up the can at the end of the day in any event. There's yet another attempt to try to expand Article 10 and use that to restrict the effect of Article 3, exactly like the argument we saw in paragraph 18 in Fidelidade that was rejected by the court. And once again, that argument is rejected. As is apparent from its wording, that provision obliges member states to set up a body with the task of providing compensation, at least up to the limits, for damage to property or personal injuries <coughs> caused in particular by a vehicle with respect to which that obligation has not been satisfied. That's the long form. Thus, the payment of compensation by such a body was designed to be a measure of last resort. The language of Churchill is reiterated in Sonka, envisaged only for situations referred to in that position, and cannot be regarded as the implementation of a guarantee scheme in respect of insurance against civil liability relating to the use of vehicles, otherwise than in those situations. So that paragraph 45, in our submission, far from assisting my learned friend, in fact, supports our analysis. <clears throat> what you've got to be careful about is the passage that follows, which is sidebarred and relied upon by my own friend. And it's the passage about coextensiveness. Because what the CJU is saying here is that the width of the obligation to ensure must correspond with the width of the breach of that obligation 
by failing to insure the vehicle. That's literally all that they're saying. In other words, we're not going to countenance giving Article 3 a narrow meaning in terms of the primary obligation on the part of the owner to insure, etc., and yet then expand <coughs> the concept of uninsured in the concept of Article 10.1 of the Directive. That would be incoherent. And so what they've done is rejected the argument at 43 <coughs> by those various parties that you can read Article 3 narrowly and then pick up the uninsured vehicles um, using Article 10.1. If I could just invite you to read 46 to 47 to yourself, you will, I hope, see that that's what's being said. If there's any doubt about that, you can once again see it from the Advocate General's opinion. Uh, if you go to page 829 to 830, you'll see um, at 70 through to 72 a slightly fuller account of um, what the UK and Ireland were arguing. And, and with respect, it's absolutely plain when you read those submissions and you understand the context of all of this, what is going on, they are seeking to control the effect of the NUC. Sure. Uh, this is in the, turn, in the Advocate General. Advocate General, 829, 70 to 71, <coughs> which explains the arguments that were being used by the UK. With all this problem... <coughs> arose in relation to vehicles which were being kept on private land that might not have been intended for use on the road. And that was more of a problem once the court in Vanuck had extended the scope of Article 3 to cover private land. And you could, you could well see how between actual practice and somebody formally exercising a statutory off-road notice, there'd be a range of people who would think that they didn't have to insure their car because they had no intention putting it anywhere near the road. But the, the natural consequence of this uh, is that if you take your car off the road and you think you've left it in the garage and are intending to leave it in the garage, you have to go on insuring it for public liability. Absolutely. And as we'll see, that's exactly the issue that came up in the Ostrowski case. It's exactly the issue. The other passage I wanted to show you was at 31 through to 36, which is the Advocate General's analysis of why the scope of Article 3, for the purposes of when there is an obligation to insure, must match the scope of the reference to Article 3 in Article 10, which is when is a car uninsured. So if you're obliged to insure a car sitting in your garage, even though you have no intention to use it on the roads, as this court concludes you are, then that is an uninsured vehicle for the purposes of the, the guarantee. That's all that this case says. Now, Ostrowski entailed some fairly extraordinary facts. The claimant was a tab, 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 tab. tab 35, I believe. Thank you. The claimant was a Polish local authority that had come to be the owner of a car following a forfeiture order. <coughs> And the forfeiture order, you can see this from the head notes at page 908, was made final by some court decision or something of that kind, served on Friday the 20th of April. And the public authority in question immediately insured the vehicle from the first day that they could, from Monday the 23rd of April 2018. The vehicle was subsequently found to be of scrap value only, and the uh, authority arranged for it to be destroyed. 
at which point the vehicle was deregistered. But then the Defendant Insurance Guarantee Fund, the equivalent of the MIBI, which has obviously got some power under Polish law to levy fines and police insurance to make sure that cars are insured, fined P, the local authority, for failing to insure the vehicle between the 7th of February and the 22nd of April. Now, the 7th of February is the date from which the order that was served on P on the 20th, in fact, took effect. So, <laughs> pretty cheeky case, you might think. They're saying that even though you've only just been told that the car is now yours and the order has just landed in your desk, the order is backdated to the date, no doubt, you sought possession or something of that kind in the beginning of February, <coughs> and you haven't paid for the vehicle to be insured, and we want our fine. And the question was in those stark and extreme facts, was there a breach of the insurance obligation? answer of the CJEU was yes there was and they held that the only thing that brought that obligation to uh, ensure to an end and you get this from H8 was the formal deregistration of the vehicle <coughs> pursuant to whatever national procedure there was that. so if you went through the statutory off-road notice procedure whatever its equivalent may be in Poland or France or whatever, and the car was sitting in your garage with a sawn, at that point, you were safe. Now, it's in that context that you must approach the paragraphs in question applying Giuliana, on which <coughs> my learned friend places so much weight, in particular, in paragraph 22 of the skeleton argument. And in particular, it's in that context that you um, must approach paragraph 56. <coughs> but so, I'm just, just looking, Mr. Donna Mayor, at um, the summary of the facts on page 914, AG13, just for the convenient place for it. Yes, my lady. So it looks as if the local authority had. <coughs> applied for the confiscation order, having seized the car. Yes. Which was presumably <coughs> illegally parked or totally something on the permit road. Right? Yes. So, so the effect of the decision is that before seizing it, they should have insured it. Well, it, the effect of it is terms. that upon seizing it, they should have immediately taken over the insurance of the vehicle. <coughs> yeah. Well, right. uh, except seizure itself doesn't amount to forfeiture. No, so the, the original owner's obligation to ensure surely would have remained on the original owner until forfeiture. I don't know. I'm not saying. All right. Well, I don't think we can assume, can we, that the obligation to ensure fell upon the district council <coughs> or the council uh, as soon as it took possession. Well, it's it's plain that the view of the relevant enforcing body in Poland is that it did. And that was the predicate for it seeking uh, the charge for the period from the 8th of February to the 23rd of, of, of April. No, I think my Lord's right in, with respect, because I, I see just reading down that the, the seizing of the car and the initial order was 16th of January. Yep. But looking at AG 40, no, it's, not, right. it's not until early Feb. And what, what, what on earth the practicability of any of this is may, may be yes. open to question. But yes, um, no, you're quite right. There's that bit just above my lord. The confiscation order became final. Yes, became final. On the 7th of February. Thank you very much, Mr. Mercy. Spot on. I'm not sure it much matters. No, no, it's just um, getting the facts right. Uh, just uh, musing about the practicalities of the driver of the tow truck yeah. pausing to consult the broker <laughs> before That's... attaching the hook. Yes, I mean, it, it, we're in that territory. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty... Um, uh, how, how do I put it? It's a it's a it's a pretty um, unconditional approach to the extent of the obligation under Article Three, pushes it to its to its maximum. But but the passage I'd invite you to look at at nine three four contains at paragraph fifty three a repetition of the passage I drew your attention to in Giuliano, <coughs> paragraph forty five. 
repetition of the fact that the 10-1 body and compensation cannot be regarded as the implementation of a guarantee scheme in respect of insurance against civil liability relating to the use of Sorry, where are you? Page uh, 934, in paragraph 53. Thank you. It's the bottom of 53. So 53, as you can see, cites <coughs> 45, the passage I drew your attention to, which is in itself drawn from Solker. And then 56, the passage my learned friend um, draws upon, is the same coextensive point, which in my submission doesn't answer the problem at all. So those are the two cases um, on the EU claim. And we say, if anything, properly understood, those cases provide further support for our analysis. So then we come to my topic seven, the domestic cases. And my learned friend's next answer, and in some ways I detect his main answer, is that um, it's not the EU authority that compels the conclusion, but it's the analysis of Mr. Justice Jay and this court in the Delaney case, principles, uh, together with um, comments by Lord Justice Flo in the Lewis and Tinder. And the problem with that is that Delaney, first and foremost, isn't EU authority. And secondly, is authority when these four cases are in their relative infancy and all that was available was Sonka. And Delaney doesn't address Fidelidad, Smith and Mead, or Liberty, all of which postdated. And Delaney addresses the first issue on the predicate, and this was the predicate accepted by my learned friend, Mr. Moser, who appeared in Delaney, that there was no argument about whether or not section 152 breached article 3 and 13 of the directive. So can we turn up to have 41, one or two. from the head note, the fact pattern, the claimant, whilst the passenger was seriously injured, caused by the driver's negligence, a substantial amount of cannabis was found in the car at the time of the accident, and the driver's insurer avoided his policy of insurance, pursuant to the now infamous section 152.2 of the RPA, on the grounds of non-disclosure of material facts. And I think one of the material facts that wasn't disclosed was that the driver was a habitual cannabis user. The insurer, standing in the shoes of the Bureau, defended the claim because it didn't fall within the 1999 uninsured driver's group because of the exclusion of that claim, whereupon the claimant issued proceedings for damages, it's a Frankish claim, against the Secretary of State, alleging that the exclusion in the 1999 agreement was incompatible with um, uh, what is now Article 10.1 of the Directive. But the UK was thereby in breach of EU law and the breach was sufficiently serious for him to be entitled to damages. And once again, there was a trial of preliminary issues on points of law. And uh, we can start with the judgment of Mr Justice Jay. He sets out the legal framework of the directive, etc. And I invite you to pick um, matters up at paragraph 20, page 1013. will see that the challenge arose in quite a different way to the present case. And it's not hard to see the reason why. We are in a pre-Lewis and Tyndale world in which no one thought the MIB was a public authority. And my learned friend, excellent lawyer as he is, reaches for the remedy that seems to be available, uh, uh, there being no potential for vertical direct effect against the insurer. So at 20, 
the material provisions of 1522 set out, and over the page at 1014, Mr Justice J points out that Tradewise has obtained a declaration, just like in this case, to the effect that the policy is avoided. And then please note this at 21. Were it not for the manner in which the MIB operates in this jurisdiction, this state of affairs would have the tendency to place the UK in breach of its obligations under the directives. If that were not already clear enough from the wording of the directives themselves, a swathe of CJU decisions state, subject to specified exceptions, any attempt by the insurer to avoid third party violence is to no effect. In fact, this is the case law he's then going to go through in great detail in this case. The MIB was first set up in 1946, etc. Um, and the defendant has sought with the aid of the MIB to accommodate its EU law obligations, such as the defendant's acceptance date, within the existing contractual framework. Although that policy decision has the potential to create tension, it was not Mr. Moses' submission in these proceedings that Section 1522 is incompatible with EU law. Now, um, there we have the essential difference between that case and this. And that then feeds into the first issue, which is the breach issue for the purposes of the Frankovich claim, which is identified at page 1017. <coughs> because perhaps entirely understandably, on the state of the law, as it then was, it was formulated in a slightly compendious fashion. The issue was whether Article 1.4, that's Article 10, either read in isolation or in conjunction with Article 3, that's still Article 3, and Article 1 of Directive 9232, imposes obligations on member states in respect of damage caused by vehicles in relation to which a valid policy of insurance was taken out, but where that policy was subsequently avoided by the insurer. That's how that matter was opened. And then the analysis that follows, in particular, at 34 and following, is a trawl through the very case law I've shown you on Article 13. Ruiz Bernaldez looked at great detail. Advocate General Lenz's opinion that I've shown you looked at great detail. Um, points that derived from Advocate General Lenz's answers to the fifth question. Of course, all of this is before Advocate General Mengozzi has arrived at different conclusions on the same materials from uh, Sonka. Points drawn from Advocate General Lenz's opinion at 39 and 40, then a review of Evans, and more particularly at 45 and following, a review of Candley, leading to the conclusion at 48, which is a very important conclusion. He says that Candelin's case is instructive in at least two ways. This was the first occasion on which the Court of Justice made crystal clear that exclusion clauses relating to the conduct of the victim, remember I made that point this morning, this was the development in Candelin, conduct of the victim, just like the drunken uh, passengers getting into the drunken driver's car, as opposed to that of the insured, could not be relied upon beyond the extent expressly mandated by the directive. To my mind, the Advocate General had said almost as much in Ruiz Bernaldez, although the, the conduct of the victim was simply not an issue. Examine what the CA, C, CJU has said in its judgment. Putting public pol policy considerations to one side, and adding it's not possible to discern any reason based on logical principle for treating exclusion clauses relating to the conduct of the victim differently, etc., etc. <coughs> so what he's saying is that by 2005, the law is absolutely clear you cannot exclude, even by reference to the victim's conduct. <coughs> then um, Farrell and Witty is considered, not so much um, <coughs> for uh, its uh, contents about the MIBI and more for what it says about passengers. And then Mr. Kennelly, who plainly has <laughs> reading the judgment as a whole, quite a tough time from Mr. Justice J. <laughs> in the course of this case. Um, some quite punchy things said later on in the judgment. Um, Mr. Kennelly um, uh, tried to rely on Sonka, and the judge uh, dealt with Sonka at 52 and 53, 
and 54, <coughs> and basically said it's an insurance case. And he explained away uh, uh, Advocate General Mengotzi's uh, analysis at 55. And that led to uh, the conclusion he reached about the case, which is that the principle of EU law vouched in Sonka's case is clear. An Article 1.4 compliant regime does not have to guarantee the satisfaction of the insurance obligation in some general way. The national body is uh, not a long stop to meet the obligation of the insolvent insurers. The guarantee which Article 1.4 mandates is limited to the case where there is no insurance policy in existence at all. But he says, in my judgment, at 58, it's all about insurance and insolvency. And at the end of 58, it says it's entirely plain from earlier Court of Justice jurisprudence, which I've discussed, that the insurer cannot seek to avoid liability to the victim on the basis of the insured's failures or the victim's misconduct, subject to the limited exceptions <coughs> being in application. Which we'd say, quite. But the problem is that because the issue has been formulated in the way that it was uh, back at page 1017, it's enough that all you have to do to show to get home is that there's a breach of Article 3 and 13 read with uh, Article 10. Because effectively, what Mr. Moser was saying is that this is a situation where the directive as a whole required there to be a remedy, and there is no remedy, and therefore it's a fact attained breach. And with that, the judge agreed. And that's why, at 63, he answered the case in the affirmative. And then he went on to consider whether or not the breach was sufficiently serious. And in essence, without taking you through the entirety of the reasoning, he concluded it was. Because the prohibition on exclusions, even in relation to passengers whose conduct might be blameworthy, such as Mr. Delaney's, had been clear since 2005 onwards. And that was the basis of the finding of sufficiently serious breach. And when you step back and ask yourself, what in essence is the breach found by Mr. Justice Jay <clears throat> on the strength of Ruiz Bernaldez and Candelin, it's that the UK system did not comply with Article 3 and 13 because the policy of insurance could be avoided after the accident. Exactly the facts we have before us today. And that's why I say, the Secretary of State's position in the Secretary of State's answer to the claim of sufficient seriousness is hopeless. Let me just show you what the Secretary of State says. I'm sure their ears will start buzzing at this point. In the supplementary bundle, last tab of the core bundle, tab 10. In relation to sufficiently seriousness, sufficient seriousness, the argument is that the judgment in Fidelidad came as a surprise to the fourth defendant. Prior to that, the Commission had not raised any concern with the fourth defendant, nor was the fourth defendant aware of such concerns with raised with the other member states. The provisions of the directive were not clear prior to the judgment in Fidelidad, nor had other entities raised concerns with the fourth defendant. Over the page D, prior to the decision in Fidelidad, the fourth defendant therefore had reasonably understood that it had complied with its obligation to <coughs> implement the directive in cases such as these. That's, that's just hopeless. The breach is exactly the one adverted to by Mr. Justice Jay in paragraph 21 of Delaney. And he's effectively saying in Delaney, unless the MIB, pursuant to its contractual arrangements, has stepped up and filled in the gap, which it hadn't, the UK would be in breach of Article 152. And that's why he was, he was punctilious to record the fact that my London friend's argument hadn't been directed at that particular provision, but that nevertheless, but for the private contractual arrangements, 
as then thought to be, of the MI, MIB, there would have been a breach of that provision because the law in the case law, which he went on to summarise, was so clear. Nothing in Fidela Dado, with respect, is in any way new, in any way new, I emphasise that, about the scope of Articles 3 and 13. The only thing that Fidela Dado adds, and I've shown you the passages that it does add, is the rejection of a new argument that attempts to read down Article 3 and 13 by reference to an expanded conception of Article 10. And that argument was rejected. So um, once you understand in our submission that Delaney is a decision reached only with Sonka before it and not with Fidelidade extending that reasoning uh, to the totality of the directive, it's a decision without the benefit of Smith and Mead and the very clear pointer in Smith and Mead that the correct remedy for a breach of Article 3 and 13 is a fact to take damages. And once you understand that in substance, the serious breach identified by Mr Justice Jay in that case is the self-same breach here, namely the breach of Article 3 and 13 by permitting an exclusion pursuant to Section 1522 in breach of, of uh, Article 3 and 13. That case is with respect no answer at all to the point we make, which is that Article 10.1 does not have, and clearly does not have, a residual function of making the MIB, or whoever is the designated Article 10 body, some kind of general guarantor of the proper transposition of all of the aspects of the directive relating to compensation, whether it's Article 3, whether it's Article 9, the minimum compensations, whether it's the proper transposition of the joy rider exception, MIB is not the guarantor of the UK's proper transposition of the directive. It is only the guarantor in relation to untraced or wholly uninsured drugs. That's the name. The last case I need to address is Lewis and Tyndale. In bundle to tab 44. I can apprehend from the fiendish question that was asked first thing this morning that my Lord <coughs> Justice Jeff Smith has read and considered this case well and thought about it deeply. You have my core point that this is a case about a pure uninsured driver. Uh, the particular complexity of Lewis and Tyndale lay in the conjunction of an uninsured driver and an accident that occurred purely on private land. And of course, the circumstances in which you may have uninsured drivers on private land are going to be very much more regular than the circumstances where there is an accident. If you tot up the accidents, the percentage of accidents on private land that are going to be uninsured are going to be higher in relation to the roads for the simple <coughs> reason that there is no obligation of compulsory insurance. And I could say, if you forgive me this evidence from the bar, that there is a, you know, a large number of claims resulting from use of quad bikes or terrain bikes or all types of manners of activity that people use with um, motored vehicles on, on private land that aren't the subject of compulsory insurance that are now wending their way to the it's exactly that reason that's led to the Monarch case being the political hot potato it is. It's exactly that reason that's led to the proposal to um, restrict the effect of Monarch by an amendment to the directive. And it's exactly that that's leading to legislation currently before Parliament in a private member's bill supported by the government to restrict the effect of Monarch. That was the particular difficulty that arose in that case. And just, to, and just remind me what your answer to one question was. Uh, if you had a 4x4 which was insured for use on the road, but not for use on private land, does that come within the scope of the article? We, we, we say it 
we say that in those circumstances the vehicle is insured. Is insured. Is insured, and that's an exclusion case. It's a scope case. It isn't insured. That's my submission to the court. And you can, and you can, you can see there's scope for both exclusion arguments and avoidance arguments, because if if there is non-disclosure about how the vehicle is going to be used on private land or for some circumstances that affects it, you can see that that will also give rise to potential misrep arguments that aren't controlled by Section 152, because Section 152 only applies in relation to compulsory motor insurance policy. Equally, that it may be that the vehicle's insured pursuant to a, a policy that isn't even motor vehicle insurance. I think you'll find that the first edition of a certain textbook doesn't deal with this. <laughs> That's because the problem <laughs> was completely unthought of. Uh, you'll be forgiven for not anticipating the, the bizarre turn that it's been up. But if I have, for instance, occupational insurance. Well, occupational employment. Em Indeed. Employ EL insurance is different. It's under a completely different regime, but it has Absolutely. the same sort of limitations. A Absolutely. And there may be avoidance of a policy, but failure to disclose the Beremi Fide that isn't caught by any provision like Section 152, because Section 152 only bites on motor vehicle insurance policy. And you can have a circumstance where somebody is run over, and I believe one of the claims before the MIB is in relation to someone who's, who's, who's hit by a forklift truck at a supermarket. That's never a vehicle that's going to be put on, um, uh, on the roads, but it's on private land. It's a motor vehicle in the very broad definition, and there's a case called Lewington that says... So it's, it's within the scope of the directive, but no obligation to insure in national law. That's right, but it's nevertheless insured. So the, 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 the directive doesn't say anything about what the type of insurance policy is. You see, uh, you yeah. see, you see the point, by the way. You I see why I say what I, I say. Actually, I think it's a complex <coughs> at, at the moment, as you can tell, I'm speaking for myself, I find it's quite difficult, and I'm working my way towards some sort of understanding. It, it seems to me to be deeply unsatisfactory that one can have at least three variants. One, no insurance policy at all. Two, a policy which doesn't purport to cover particular areas of, of use, which may be within the directive but aren't within the RTA. Three, something which is within the directive, is within the RTA, but is subject to an exclusion clause, which is a different one. And then there was a fourth, but I think we can work out what the fourth is, if I could remember what the first, second, and third were. <laughs> but, but I mean, the, As I understand the, the, these all have different answers on your submissions. As I understand it, it's even more complicated than that, because um, well, your, your, your motor insurance policy, I mean, well contemplates the driving on private land, for instance, you're driving up a drive to someone's house on private land. Generally, it will apply in those circumstances as well. I mean, it's, it, these are all the horrendous complexities produced by Benag. There's no getting around that. But you say it's really quite simple. If if it's subject to uh, the directive, and the UK hasn't made provision which is coextensive with the directive for whatever reason, and the vehicle is insured in to some extent at some stage at the time of the accident. Yeah, well that brings in straight away an English insurance lawyer's concept of void ab initio. But leave that on one side. You say that if you get through those steps, then the remedy is against the state. Correct. The se well, the Secretary of State. Correct. And just because just because the MIB is an emanation of the state, you can't just say, ah, oh, well, we found an emanation of the state on a Thursday, let's clobber that one. Absolutely right. I mean, it's like, I'm putting it slightly technically, but, but that's, <laughs> that, that's exactly that, That's really what you're saying. Indeed. But it's beguilingly simple. Beguilingly In simple. <laughs> <laughs> Now, um, Lewis and Tyndale um, some of this authority was canvassed before for justice flow and the rest of the court. Sonker, you can see, was cited in the judgment, as was Delaney. Um, uh, Bernalda, as you can see, was cited in the skeleton argument. And what is uh, conspicuous uh, by its absence is Fidelidade. Uh, 
And of course, um, in Lewis, the court wasn't having to address head on the issue that I've described, which is whether or not there is this third category of case in relation to a car which is insured at the time of the accident. I mean, there's no doubt that it's insured up until the point that there is avoidance, even if you take a void ab initio analysis. Until that uh, uh, declaration is made, the car is insured. And, and immediately, you can see how that produces some problems under the directive. Because if it's insured up to that purpose, there's all kinds of provisions about how the insurer has to liaise with the MIBI. How can you operate those uh, provisions in a world in which you're then going to go on to say, that where there is a cancellation, that vehicle is to be treated as an uninsured vehicle. I mean, even those provisions are inconsistent with the notion of later avoidance making the car an uninsured vehicle. But this issue, with respect, isn't fully grappled with um, by the court. It's fair to say that um, Sonka was cited <coughs> at, at 70, page 1143. And he was explained away on the same basis as Delaney, which was that it was all about there being no obligation to uh, underwrite the risk of insolvency. The same explanation that was given in Delaney, in particular by Lord Justice Richards. But that's an explanation that we know has been falsified by Fidelidade because the Sonka reasoning has been applied directly in the avoidance of policy context. And then the Giuliana case is referred to at 71 and 72. And I think my learned friend places a particular reliance on 72. Well, what is quite apparent is that Mr. Uh, Mercer hasn't put paragraph 45 and what that contains uh, and its uh, uh, adoption of the Fidele Dade reasoning hasn't gone through all the travaux, etc. So that the court hasn't had the benefit of the argument that you've had or not had from me this morning. And simply taken that passage in paragraph 46 out of context, in particular out of context of paragraph 45 that preceded it. But in any event, it's clear at 73 that Lord Justice Flo felt that even if he was wrong about was plain from Farrell and Whitty that the compensation body is intended to protect and compensate the victims in relation to uninsured vehicles, which was the facts of that case. It was an uninsured vehicle, squarely within the ratio of the CJU in Farrell and Whitty number two. So um, 72 is either overturn or, or per and curia. And what this court has to do, with respect, is wrestle with that extra case law and its implications, and it do so in particular in the light of the travail. And we say, with the, the greatest of respect to the learned judge below, that the central passage of his reasoning in the judgment, which you'll find. Roman numeral 21, the discussion, page 116 and following, he's wrong. It's wrong because he misunderstands the directive <coughs> as a whole and the point as it contains. It's wrong because it fails to extract what we pointed to from the travaux. And it's wrong because it fails to correctly read the four cases upon uh, which uh, we've relied. And therefore, and I'm not going to labour the point, for all the reasons that are spelt out in the uh, skeleton argument, once you probably understand the material, uh, it's, um, it's unsustainable reasoning. <coughs> and you can see the fullness of uh, the way that my... Um, colleague Miss Kinsler put it at 61 and following the skeleton argument, um, with which we wholly agree. 
each of these consequences of 61 and following are errors in the judgment consequent upon the misunderstanding uh, of uh, the case law, both at the EU level, the four cases, the Giuliano case, and on the domestic level, and the excessive read into uh, Delaney. And at the end of the day, there just simply isn't a satisfactory answer to those key passages from Fidelidade and Smith and Mead. I mean, the passages in Smith and Mead, both of the court and of the advocate generals, are absolutely clear in case on all fours for this case that the route home is fantastic. <coughs> and equally, Delaney is absolutely clear that that's a sufficiently serious breach. Well, I'm, I'm obviously missing something. Uh, Lewis and Tyndale proceeds, rightly or wrongly, on the basis that the state was in breach of its obligation. Correct. And the Court of Appeal enforced the claim directly against the MIB. Correct. And you, I think you're submitting to us, I think you must be submitting to us that that was wrong. No. Well, can, can you explain the difference to me? The difference is that in Lewis and Tyndale, the vehicle was uninsured. <coughs> and yet, because the accident was on private land, and the way that the 99 then current agreement had culminated, the MIB only responded to a claim in private land. There was no claim under the MIB agreement. And that situation, that failure to provide a remedy in relation to uninsured driver within scope of Article 3 of the Directive on private land <coughs> was in breach and this is the critical point I make, it was in breach of that which is contained by Article 10 because it was an uninsured driver I, I, I just don't understand at the moment, I'm, I'm very sorry, I'm obviously being very slow about this the, the, There was, there was, it was treated as being an uninsured case. But it wasn't just treated. It, it, was, it, was. An, all right, it was an uninsured case. Therefore, you say it's not within the scope of. No, it is, it is within the scope of. That's the point, Mike. It's There are two categories that we accept are in, in scope untraced drivers and uninsured drivers. Okay. But why don't, why, and, and the government had, the UK government has failed to require coverage, such coverage. Therefore, the failure is by the UK government. Yes. But nevertheless, the MIB is plainly the emanation of the state. As it is in this case. For the discharge of the two things that are in scope. And once it's the emanation of the state has been entrusted with the discharge of the two functions, uninsured and untraced drivers that are in scope, the fact that on a domestic plane, its arrangements don't deliver is no answer bound as a matter of community law to provide compensation. That's why this case is only about the community uh, dimension. We're not having any argument about the MIB agreements at all. We're looking at everything from the perspective of what the obligation is under Article 10. And the obligation was plainly engaged in this. It was an uninsured driver case. Once you've expanded the scope of Article 3 to include private land, it matters not that the uninsured driver was on private land. It would be just the same if Mr Tyndale had been driving his car on the road or on the land. He's an uninsured driver. That's in scope. The UK regime doesn't provide compensation in those circumstances. That's a breach of Article 10. Not of Article 3 and 13. It's a breach of Article 10. And there is no case of Article Three breach in Lewis and Tinder. The breach was only that of the, the owner of the car and failing to get the car insured. Okay, well, I may ask you to reformulate this again tomorrow. But at the moment, I've got in Lewis, the vehicle was uninsured and therefore within the scope of the directive. That's right. The government had imposed on the MIB the discharge of the obligation to provide compensation compensation in such cases. It's not just in the scope of the directive, it's in the scope of Article 10 of the directive. That's the critical point. Okay. Well, um, I may come back to that tomorrow when I'm slightly more clear-headed about what it's all about. Thank you. Well, um, apologies.
apologies if I've been <coughs> no, no, less than clear. Um, I just don't find this very easy. The, okay. it, it really does come down to this central point, my lord. Do we think that there's two categories or three categories of uh, circumstance that are in scope under Article 3? In our case, is uninsured drivers, I mean, someone for whom there, there was not in force at the time of the accident any form of uh, policy, they're in scope, and untraced drivers. But what is not in scope, see the Trevor and Seal arguments, uh, are drivers who were insured at the time of the accident but who have subsequently excluded liability. They're not in scope. And if they're not in scope, you can't make a claim under Article 10 against the MIB. All you can do is sue the UK for breach of Article 3 and 13 by committing avoidance. <laughs> I think I've now got it. Here they were insured and therefore not in scope and therefore not amenable to a claim. Exactly. Whereas the Secretary of State is because he's failed to provide. That's right. He's given them the get out by allowing them to avoid the policy under Section 152 in breach of Article 3 and 13. That's the operative breach. The operative breach. And that's the operative breach identified in Smith and Mead, which they say the relevant remedy is a claim. Uh, Mr. Mason. My Lord, I, I want to start, if I may, with the last bit of my learned friend's submissions, because um, although this takes me out of the order in which I, I plan to make the rest of my submissions, which will end with the English case law. Uh, I, uh, I would like to start uh, with Lewis and Tyndale because I simply do not recognize, my lord, the characterization of Lewis and Tyndale that has just been put before the court. Uh, I mean, it's a case which, as has been pointed out, I was in. Um, it's, if your lordship is still there, your lordships are still there in uh, authorities bundle two at tab four to four. Uh, if one uh, looks at the head note, one sees the claimant brought proceedings seeking compensation for injuries suffered when an uninsured vehicle driven by the first defendant collided with him on private land. Fine. The first defendant having been debarred from defending the claim, the second defendant, the MIB, did not dispute his full liability but contended that it was not obliged to compensate the claimant pursuant to the Motor Insurance Bureau Agreement 1999 because the first defendant's liability was not one in respect of which a contract of insurance should have been in force in order to comply with the article. So my learned friend is absolutely right in saying that it was part of the factual background to Lewis and Tyndale that as it happens, the insurance on the 4x4 four four had lapsed. But, my lords, that is not what the case was about. That was not the argument that uh, the MIB relied on or we relied on. My learned friend, in his closing remarks some moments ago, sought to recast this case as being one all about no insurance being in place. But that is not what that case was about. Uh, if one looks on uh, in uh, the report, and by the way, I note in passing at uh, 1,124, at between G and H, that one of the cases cited in argument was Smith and Mead, although it doesn't appear in the judgment. But if one looks on in uh, the judgment, uh, they... Um, The argument of the MIB is summarised at paragraph 37 at page 1135. Uh, just after it is not disputed by Mr. Merson that in relation to the tasks which have been delegated to it, the MIB is an emanation of the state. His case, that's the MIB's case to which I now turn, is that the task delegated to the MIB 
is the RTA liability, not the broader obligation on the state to comply with the 2009 directive. That's what the case was about, by the way. It was not at all. I'm sorry, I was just making a note. Can you I, give, where are you? Yeah, I'm on page 1135 at the paragraph 37. Thank you. So what the case was about is that the task, the task delegated to the MIB, is the RTA liability, in brackets, therefore excluding private land, close brackets, not the broader obligation on the state to comply with the 2009 directive. That was the argument. It was not at all an argument about whether this was uninsured or an insured theatre. So it was not an Article 13 or whatever case. It was a case uh, about scope, plain and simple. And it's in this context, my lords, that as everyone seems to agree, if one turns on at paragraph 46 uh, on page 1137, <coughs> Mr. Mercer submitted whether that's a concession or otherwise, that Article 10, so that's the article about the obligations of the body, was coextensive with Article 3, and that's the obligation for universal insurance. Uh, the MIB agrees with that today, as they uh, ever did, and we rely on it. There was then the discussion of Chonka, uh, and at paragraph 50 of Lewis and uh, Tyndale, Mr. Mercer placed particular reliance on that part of Chonka, which says that the compensation body, actually it's the, it's the guarantee fund, but the, the, the compensation body provided for in Article 10 will only respond in circumstances where there has been a breakdown in the system established, not where there is no system at all. It was quite a technical argument, my lords, about, well, um, the, the case law of the CJEU suggests that where there is a breakdown <coughs> in the system, you're going to be responsible. He said, ah, yes, but that's not this case. In this case, there is no system at all. Uh, and um, there is the uh, argument at 52, uh, talking about uh, the case of uh, Chonka, uh, I'm sorry, about the um, case of Giuliana. We're now into Giuliana. Uh, there's the recital of uh, Giuliana 52, where the court rejected the argument advanced by the UK government, amongst others, that Article 3 could be given a narrow interpretation because the compensation body provided for in what is now Article 10 could pay compensation in such circumstances. Uh, and that's Giuliana. And then there is the uh, reliance on paragraph 46 of the judgment, which my learned friend, I detect, was somewhat critical of what Mr. Mercer should have, should have pointed out more uh, uh, around Chonka. But here we have again squarely the argument on scope, the sort of argument that we see in Giuliana. My learned friend criticised any reliance on Giuliana by saying, oh, well, it's not an Article 13 case. We generally heard a lot about Article 13 today, my lords, which is perhaps surprising. It's not even referenced in my learned friend's skeleton argument. We don't rely on Giuliana as an Article 13 case. We rely on it as a scope case because Lewis and Tyndale we rely on is also a scope case. That is our case. My learned friend has slightly sought, um, it may sound unkind if I say by a form of, of misdirection uh, in, in the stage sense, um, to, to reclassify the arguments, including uh, as then became clear, Lewis and Tyndale, as a different sort of case, as a case about insured, uninsured. No, it's about scope. And that's why it matters what my Lord, Lord Justice Flo says about the responsibilities of the body. Um, <clears throat> my uh, arguments are uh, uh, summarised um, in the rest of the judgment of 56, my emphasis on... Um, certain case law, at 58, by a parity of reasoning, the directly affected right asserted by the claimant was precisely the type of right 
for which the United Kingdom had already conferred residual liability where the driver was uninsured, as in the present case, upon the MIB. No question of the Article 3 and 10 obligations being conditional, as the MIB suggested, and they have direct effect. My Lord, we come to my Lords, we come to the analysis and conclusions that my learned friend also came to some moments ago at 63 of Lord Justice Flo's judgment. And he finds this. The UK government has failed to fulfil its obligations under Article 3 of the 2009 Directive <coughs> to ensure that civil liability in respect of the use of motor vehicles on private land is the subject of a scheme of compulsory motor insurance. That's the operative breach, my lords. Give me the document of that. I will read on in a moment. Um, that the government, I read on, that the government is under that obligation in respect of the use of vehicles on private land cannot be doubted in view of the judgments in Vnuk and Andrade. The government has also failed to comply with its coextensive obligation under Article 10 to assign responsibility for meeting that liability compensation body contemplated by that article, just as the Irish government has failed in Farrell and Whitty. But my lords, I come back to the point, the operative breach in Lewis and Tinder was the breach of Article 3. My learned friend's submission that there, and I noted this, quotes, was no breach of Article 3 in Lewis and Tinder, unquote which is no doubt a rare lapse from an excellent lawyer, but is completely contrary to the facts. There was an Article 3 breach in Lewis and Tyndale. That is what the case was principally about. There was also the issue that there had been no express assigning of that responsibility to <coughs> the uh, MIB, which the MIB relied on, say, perhaps in an echo of my learned friend's submissions earlier today, oh, well, there could have been other body. <coughs> they could have assigned it to some other fund. They never assigned it to us. We're not responsible. Sue them. Uh, and that's what that last bit of uh, uh, paragraph uh, uh, 63 is about. In fact, in the present case, my lords, I say we are a fortiori of the position in Lewis because in the present case all the facts are in principle within the RTA and the obligation has been assigned to the MIB. The reason there was that extra sentence at the end in 63 in Lewis and Tyndale is because nobody had dreamt before Vnuk of private land being within scope. And so uh, it was not something that was in the MIB agreement or anywhere else in the arrangements between the government and uh, the MIB. In particular, it wasn't in the RTA, which is what the MIB agreement says it covered. But that's not a problem in the present case. On the present facts, this is a much more straightforward case than Lewis and Tyndale. It didn't take place in a fee. It took place on the road that the vehicle that was used was an ordinary motor car used for its proper purpose, entirely within uh, the RTA. If the uh, insurance policy had been voided the day before the accident, the MIB presumably would not have quibbled. Uh, it is because it was voided after the accident that they've raised the arguments that they have. Uh, and again, uh, my lords, we had today an almost exact echo of the arguments made by Mr. Mercer QC on behalf of the MIB in front of Lord Justice Flo uh, and that constitution of the Court of Appeal, which was that, well, um, the uh, uh, MIB has not <coughs> had delegated to it uh, this particular responsibility. But that was rejected in no uncertain terms by Lord Justice Flo at paragraph 64 over the page at 1142. Uh, and uh, what Lord Justice Flo did there is he referred to his own judgment in Bern in 2009 
which he had actually overturned in, in part in another uh, uh, part of this uh, case, because that was um, a, a, um, <coughs> that was a pre farrell and witty case. In Bern, he'd found the MIB wasn't an emanation of the state. Uh, uh, he overturned that uh, in Lewis and Tyndale. But he'd also found in Bern that um, I concluded, this is a B, I concluded the relevant discretion had been fully used in circumstances where the UK had chosen to designate the MIB as the body through which it sought to implement the motor insurance directives. That conclusion was not challenged on appeal in Bern. I see no reason to reach a different conclusion in the present case. And so again, uh, my lords, that point has been answered. And again, we are a fortiori of the situation in Lewis and Tyndale. Um, because uh, uh, in Lewis and Tyndale, we had to deal with a situation where prior to Vnook, none of this was in scope at all. The idea that uh, the, <coughs> um, uh, duty on private land to ensure. And so the conclusion at 66, my lords, accordingly, in my judgment, and contrary to the arguments advanced on behalf of the MIB, Article 3 of the 2009 Directive is unconditional and precise, is capable of having direct effect. Since it's common ground that Article 3 and Article 10 are coextensive, it must follow that Article 10 is also capable of having direct effect. And that was important because that had never actually been expressly found before in relation to Article 10. And uh, at 68, the distinction which Mr. Mercer sought to draw between cases where there had been a breakdown of the system and cases such as he categorized the present case where there was no system at all. A wholly uh, artificial one. But I, mean, I, I would say in, in parentheses, for present purposes, uh, in, a, in any case, the present case is one where there was a breakdown system. So on the submissions of the MIB in that case, in Lewis and Tyndale, we would be home already, because they, they, they argued what my learned friend Mr. Mercer was saying, was, well, if there's a breakdown of the system, of course we're responsible. They're not saying that now, uh, but uh, I just point that out in passing. E even so, even, even though it was, in a sense, a harder case for us in Lewis and Tyndale, uh, Lord Justice Flo uh, would have none of it. And there is then uh, what we've seen in uh, uh, 69 uh, over the page 1143. I think my learned friend, actually, my, I think my learned friend skipped over this bit. But both in Farrell, <coughs> bless you. Thank you. Both in Farrell and Witty number two and the present case, the effect of the failure is the same. A gap in the insurance cover compulsorily required by the domestic legislation and a corresponding gap in the protection of the victims of motor accidents, which, as is clear, all the jurisprudence is the very mischief the motor insurance directives are designed to avoid. And we see there again, my lords, a reflection of what it means for Articles 3 and 10 to be coextensive. If there is a breach of Article 3, it follows axiomatically that that is in scope also for Article 10. <coughs> and if for whatever reason the insurer has fallen out of the picture, as was the case in, in Lewis, there the reason was non-renewal, then the MIB body picks up the coextensive uh, obligation of the state. There is uh, the uh, dis distinguishing of Chonka at 70. Chonka cannot be regarded as a case where the member state had failed to implement its obligations under Articles 3 and 10 of the Directive. There was simply no obligation on the state to implement a compensation scheme in respect of insurance cover formerly provided by insurers who had become insolvent. And my lords, I'm going to say, uh, although I may not reach it now until tomorrow, that that is still good law uh, as it ever was. My learned friends' uh, arguments relying on Fiddly Dade and Smith <coughs> and Mead, uh, we say. We say nothing, nothing in those later cases changes the analysis of Chonka here. For reasons I'll explain, I'll try not to do everything at once. My lords, Chonka is distinguished in 70. Uh, there's a reference to Juliana 
in 71. As I've said, I don't accept the criticism that somehow, well, Giuliano is not an Article 13 case, and therefore somehow it doesn't matter. But this, this isn't an Article <coughs> 13 case. This is, this is a scope case. Uh, and Lord Justice Flo says, um, the reference in the last sentence of Para 46 of the CJU and Giuliana to the insurance obligation is not to the relevant national legislation, but to the obligation on the member state under Article 3 of the directive, as is clear from the preceding sentence and from the next paragraph of the judgment. And then there is the, the citation of the judgment from Giuliana. And because it's here, I, I will just read it. Uh, the, the interpretation set out in the present judgment makes it possible to ensure the attainment of the objective of protecting the victims of accidents caused by motor vehicles laid down by the directives concerning insurance against civil liability in respect of the use of vehicles, which has consistently been pursued and reinforced by the legislature. That interpretation guarantees that those victims are, in any case, compensated either by the insurer under a contract entered into for that purpose or by the body referred to in Article 1, 4, now Article 10, in the event that the obligation to insure the vehicle involved in the accident has not been satisfied or where that vehicle has not been identified. And my learned friend says several times, well, I rely so heavily on these uh, European authorities and uh, I'm somehow wrong to do so, but here is Lord Justice Flo uh, uh, approving and citing uh, uh, Giuliano. And of course, the important points, it is a guarantee, my lords. It is not. Uh, it is not somehow an option for the state, uh, and it is a closed system <clears throat> where either the insurer or the body are going to have to pay out. In any case, where the obligation to insure has not been satisfied. That's the breach of Article 3, coextensive with Article 10. As one of the Advocate Generals put it, where, whenever there is an obligation under Article 3, then the body has the obligation to span a safety net under uh, uh, that, under Article 10. And the safety net and the obligation have to be of exactly the same size uh, as any circus artist uh, will be painfully aware. My lords, um, that's 72. Uh, my learned friend has already uh, read out part of this paragraph. Uh, contrary to Mr. Mercer's submissions, Giuliano is not authority for the proposition that Article 10 does not extend to provide compensation in situations <coughs> where the national legislation did not provide for compulsory motor insurance. On the contrary, the judgment recognizes and applies the broader objectives of the directives of protecting the victims of motor rights by requiring member states to ensure that motor insurance is compulsory so that the victims are compensated by the insurer or, in cases where the obligation to insure the vehicle has not been satisfied, <coughs> by the body, to which that task has been delegated under Article 10. Now, my learned friend says, oh, this is obitel per incuria, or something, um, because, he says, this is a case that's about non-insurance. Uh, I hope I've shown that this is not a case about non-insurance, and hence this is not obitel per incurium. This, is, this was the subject of burning interest and, uh, uh, and discussion, both at first instance and in this court, in Lewis and Tyndale. Uh, and it was a most important finding, if I say so, uh, with respect. Um, and the last sentence of paragraph 46, uh, that's of Juliana, is sufficiently widely phrased to encompass both the case where the state has not fully implemented its insurance obligation and uh, where the state has implemented, uh, and the case where although the state has implemented the obligation, the driver or owner of the vehicle has not taken out the compulsory insurance required. Uh, I mean, pause, pausing there, my lords, uh, an, another way of looking at the situation in the present case is that the owner of the vehicle, or rather the <coughs> Mr. Schuker Sr., Nicholas Schuker, the driver's father, who took out the insurance, didn't take out a compulsory insurance of the kind uh, required under the, 
directly because it was voidable, which should never have, against the victim, which should never have been possible. So whichever way one looks at it, it is a failure to put in place the system that the directive requires. More straightforwardly, of course, uh, we have the breach of Article Section, uh, the, the, the breach of Section 1522, which is a breach of the Article 3 obligation uh, anyway that enables that insurance to be void. Uh, so that again is an end to it, my notes, because of the coextensive nature of Articles 3 and 10. So far from being obiter, that, that was in fact the uh, disposal of the case. That's the ratio. And then there is an alternative at 73. However, even if I were wrong about that, says Lord Justice Flo, it is quite clear from the broad terms of paragraph 39 of the judgment in Farrell Witty number 2, that's the case about the maybe being an emanation of the state, uh, that the compensation body is intended to protect and compensate victims by remedying the failure of the member state to fulfill its obligation under Article 3 to ensure that civil liability in respect of the use of motor vehicles is covered by insurance. As the CJEU jurisprudence makes clear, that obligation includes the use of vehicles on private land. Well, as um, the CJU jurisprudence <coughs> makes clear in our case, my lords, uh, that obligation uh, includes uh, insurance not being voidable for misrepresentation three months after the accident. Accordingly, in my judgment, the MIB, albeit a private law body, has had conferred on it by the UK government the task under Article 10, which, as Farrell and Whitty makes clear, includes remedying the failure of the government to institute in full of a compulsory insurance regime. And it avails the institution at nothing, my lords, to say, oh, it's a, it's a different emanation of the state. It's the Secretary of State, in fact, who laid the legislation. And we see that uh, uh, dealt with uh, in, in my uh, respectful submission uh, very well by Mr. Justice Friedman in the, in the judgment below. That, that all, all the authorities are clear that which which bit of the state is, is guilty, as it were, is no concern of ours. The question is, uh, is this within the scope of what the MIB has had conferred on it by the UK government? And the answer is yes, because it's a breach of Article 3 and therefore of Article 10. And again, the fact of the vehicle being also uninsured played no part in this conclusion, uh, as indeed it played no significant part in the arguments in Lewis and Tyndale. So, Lord, having started there, uh, <coughs> which is to some extent uh, anticipating my, uh, my conclusions. Um, can, can I return to the beginning of my response to my learned friend? Unless uh, I don't know how long the, the court intends to sit. We've got a, at least a quarter of an hour of regular time. I don't know how much extra time. Um, well, well let's, let's see how we get on just after four. And if you're coming to a natural break, you, you'll no doubt let us know. My Lord, yes. Uh, so I, I intend to address the court on the following issues uh, in turn, in response, uh, very much in the <coughs> same order uh, as my learned friend, although I'd like to start. So the first is reminding ourselves of the chronology of these proceedings. Uh, and the second, to look again, but um, thanks to the excellent efforts of Mr. Delamere QC, much more brief at the directive. <coughs> uh, and uh, third deal with my learned friend's points about the travaux, travaux preparatoire <coughs> and his contention that they introduce a specific exception that requires the victim to bring a Frankovich damages claim against the state, <coughs> including the reliance specifically on Fidlidade and Smith and Mead. And, and then uh, finally and fourth, the UK case law, including the judgment below, which we've hardly seen, my lord. So, um, the chronology. There is a chronology in 
core in the core bundle <coughs> at tab four. which I believe is agreed. And we see at um, page 72, the accident took place on the 27th of March 2015. And my client was a front seat passenger and suffered a catastrophic injury. The um, second defendant was the insurer, and we see on the 3rd of May 2016, the second defendant applied to the Birmingham, Birmingham High Court for a declaration to void its insurance policy on the vehicle at which had been taken out by Nicholas Shook of the first defendant's farm. Over the page, on the 22nd of June 2016, the second defendant's declaration was granted by the district registry in Birmingham. Perhaps, just so your lordships have seen it, a cross-reference to that is the supplementary bundle, tab four, page 44. There are two page numbers on this page. Uh, it's the, the furthest right, 44. And we see there, this was the uh, Birmingham District Registry. Uh, UK Insurance was the insurer. Uh, Mr. Nicholas Shuka was the father of the driver. He had said not only that he was the uh, holder of the vehicle, um, um, but various other things. In fact, it was the driver who owned the vehicle, except the driver had no foreign license. We see that counsel for uh, UK insurance had been heard, no attendance by Mr. Shuka, and uh, upon recording that no acknowledgement of service had been filed by the defendant, <coughs> it was ordered pursuant to section 152, it is declared the claimant is entitled to avoid the motor policy <coughs> of a certain number issued to the defendant in separated in 2014. Uh, and it's, it's not in, uh, in dispute that it was so avoided, uh, which took effect ab initio. So, my lords, from, uh, from that back into the chronology, uh, some almost two years later, on the 23rd of March 2018, the claim form was issued. By this time, the insurance policy was null and void. Uh, jumping on a bit, on the 4th of April 2019, <coughs> there was the order of Mrs Justice O'Farrell striking out the claim against the second defendant. And I think it's been uh, adverted to by my learned friend, but just for the sake of completeness, that is at tab 5 of the supplementary bundle. At uh, the last pages, page 45, Uh, the order of the 29th of March 2019. And we see uh, we've got the first claimant, uh, in fact, the claimant, Mr. Colley, the first defendant, the uh, driver, UK Insurance still listed as the second defendant, um, the third defendant, the Motor Insurance Bureau, not yet the Secretary of State. It's worth noting that the, the MIB was a party to, to these proceedings. It, it did appear and make arguments. It was not argued, and there's nothing between us on this, that the insurer was liable, um, and uh, uh, it is not claimed by the MIB that Mrs Justice O'Farrell's judgment was somehow wrong. The claim against the second defendant, the insurance company, was dismissed. We know why, uh, because <coughs> of the uh, problem with horizontal direct between uh, Mr. Colley and UK Insurance. Uh, permission was granted to add the Secretary of State for Transport as a fourth defendant, and we see that at page 46. Uh, 
also permission granted at five to the third defendant to bring contribution proceedings by serving and filing a contribution notice on the Secretary of State for transport. We um, see then putting that away uh, back in the chronology on the 8th of April, the third defendant filed and served its contribution notice on the fourth defendant. Now, I, I, it's, it's not in the, bu in the bundle. There are uh, exchanges between the third defendant and the Secretary of State, and the Secretary of State has indeed pleaded in response. Uh, denying uh, the liability under the contribution notice. I think we did have that before, Mr Justice Friedman. It's not in the bundle here. Uh, if anything turns on it, I'm sure it can be arranged for the court. But uh, it, it's, it's not dissimilar to the arguments um, my learned friend has brought, uh, has, has brought your attention to in relation to Frankovich. What the Secretary of State says in a nutshell is, uh, we were entirely surprised until Fiddly Dade came along. We had no idea that this is what the, the law meant, uh, and um, there was no sufficiently serious breach. And as, as uh, your lordships know, and as I think uh, has been pointed out by the court, sufficiently serious breach is, is a different test to the directly effective right that my giant enjoys against the MIB uh, under sufficiently serious breach, the Secretary of State will no doubt bring arguments around what did other bodies find, what did the Commission think, was there a notice from the Commission telling us that we're in breach, they point out no there wasn't, all of, the, all of that uh, is, uh, is brought in in a sufficiently serious breach case and of course we have that in Delaney, including disclosure about what different civil servants did or didn't think, and what third parties did or didn't think, was the law at the relevant time. So it is a, a far more complex exercise. A, a lot was said about the Secretary of State. It's, it's really not for us to intrude on the uh, interstate wrangling between the MIB and the Secretary of State. I'll point out that, of course, the case against the Secretary of State is stayed. So there's, there's some criticism being made of the Secret Secretary of State not being here, but he'd have had to unstay in order to appear here. Anyway, uh, over the page on page 74, we see on the 4th of October, there was an order staying this matter behind Lewis and Tinder. It was thought uh, that that uh, would have some relevance, as it did. Indeed, uh, it was thought it might be dispositive of the matter, but uh, plainly it has uh, not been, at least as far as the MIB is concerned. Um, and then on uh, the 14th of December 2020, we have the judgment below. Uh, worth noting, the mission for reference to the European Court of Justice refused. That would have been just possible on the 14th of December 2020. Indeed, in, in theory, it would have been possible for my learned friends to um, apply. Of course, it was different learned friends. My learned friends to apply uh, for permission to this court on an expedited basis before the 31st of December. Uh, but no such application was made. And so here we are. J just before you move on, yes. Mr. Moser, <coughs> without in inviting you to go, go into any detail. Can I just understand the, the brief summary you gave us a moment ago of the argument raised by the Secretary of State in defence to the, the, the contribution notice and the, <coughs> also, I take it, to um, Mr Colley's claim against the Secretary of State. It, it, it seemed to be focusing on, on what might be described as a, a subjective assessment of the culpability of the party concerned in <coughs> wandering into breach without really knowing what was going on, as opposed to the objective seriousness uh, of the, the, the actual breach. 
it, it, is there some case law which says one way or the other uh, whether that kind of subjective culpability approach is a, a permissible one or indeed the only appropriate one? Well, well Lord, there, there is a, a so-called multifactorial test for breach, which but takes into account... Uh, uh, end of attempt to categorise. <laughs> which takes into account all of those factors to a greater or lesser degree. Right. And that is Lord Clyde in um, practical terms. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, yes. Well, I mean, my, my learned friend points out that important factors, some, some factors are more important than others, and the clarity of the obligation uh, uh, and the nature of the obligation are, are important ones, and yeah. then there are, there are others. Uh, it's, it's almost bound to be set out somewhere in Delaney. Well, I, I, I don't want you to, don't want to take you out, no. of the, out of the school, sir. Because to check. It, it, it will be in there. Perhaps somebody can find the reference uh, either now or I'll bring it tomorrow morning All right. to the multifactorial test <clears throat> for Frankovich damage. Uh, my Lord, I wonder if this is a convenient moment. That's the end of the chronology. Next, I will be diving into the directive. And I wonder whether at 4 pm your Lordships want to go back into the directive. Or Approach it refreshed in the morning. And I have found this enthusiasm. We'll leave it there. Okay. Yes. Well, well, we'll, we'll leave it there, Mr. Moser. But perhaps before we um, part for the day, can I just raise with you um, one question about which um, I may be unnecessarily troubled? Maybe some very simple answer to it. Um, much attention has been focused on the requirement of uh, Article 10 that the, <coughs> the vehicle be insured as opposed to the driver. Now, uh, unless I've missed it, and I may very well have done, the, the, the relevant agreed fact, which is the basis on which these um, preliminary issues are being argued, um, <coughs> number six, is simply an admission claimant knew that Mr. Shuker didn't have a valid driving license and was not insured to drive the vehicle. It, 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 does anything turn upon that, or am I troubling myself unnecessarily? I, I don't see how you get from that to a, a, a factual basis for saying that he knew the vehicle was not insured. That's why we've drawn ground two. Why we accept that the argument in relation to ground two is not sustainable. The test is that you have to know that the vehicle is uninsured, not that the driver who is using the vehicle is uninsured. And he may or may not have known what the state of the play was as far as the existence of a policy. Yes, and that's why concerned. this we made the point we made about symmetry. <coughs> Once the focus in ten two is on whether the vehicle is uninsured, it must mean uninsured at the point that you get into the car, which is why we say learned friend can't have it both ways. Well, I, speaking entirely for myself, every time I've seen the formulation of that in the papers, I've tried to find a slightly different formulation, which is simply that the claimant could not have known that, it was unin that the vehicle was uninsured because it had not yet been avoided. Which just leaves open the question, which may still be an issue about what the impact of avoidance may be. Yes, I understand that. Yeah. Um, the reference my learned friend was looking for in Delaney was quite right to expect that uh, Lord Clyde's test is set out in paragraph 36 of uh, Lord Justice Richard's judgment, page 1054. So, page 1054. That's very helpful. Thank you. I'm, I'm good. I'm most grateful. And, and <coughs> my Lord. I, I, I haven't myself answered your Lordship's question. No, no. Your Lordship has had a, a, a number of answers. The, the answer that I uh, was going to give was indeed that our, our principal point about that was uh, he, he never said that he knew the vehicle was uninsured because he, uh, in fact, said the contrary. He 
He said he knew that uh, Mr. Shuka Sr. had insured the vehicle, which is quite interesting. Uh, but that Mr. Shuka Jr. Uh, had um, not got an insurance himself. He couldn't know at that stage that it was uninsured because that hadn't happened yet. That mm. happened several months it, uh, I, I understand. in the future. All right, thank you. Well, then we'll, um, we'll accede to your invitation to commit us a, a fresh dive at 10.30 tomorrow. Um, roughly speaking, how, how long do you think you're going to need tomorrow? You're not under any pressure, it's just so that we all know roughly where we stand. Well, I, I, I should imagine I'm going to need a fair part of the morning, yeah. but enough for the usual sort of uh, reply uh, to be, <laughs> to, right. to, to be f <laughs> slotted in at the end, before lunch, I hope. I can hardly complain, I suggested my learning to do exactly the same thing, as long as I have all right, you thank you both very much. And um, 10.30 tomorrow. <coughs>